by the board uh, of the uh, institution that is governing. Uh, some places they call it the board of regents, others the board of leaders, board of trustees, board of governors in different places or in terms of different states have different language they use for the board. And that is even the case at a private institution. So uh, all ratified hires, particularly when you talk about uh, leadership positions, head coaches, uh, if you would, in these particular cases, VPs of athletics, deans of colleges for those on the academic side, provosts, uh, and presidents, chancellors, they are all hired uh, by the board. And so that's the case until you ratify that. Nothing is complete until that is done. All right, just to bring people up to speed, I, I think we had an audio issue to start the show, but we were just setting the stage of what happened uh, yesterday on two different fronts. Alcorn State fills the position uh, left by Fred McNair, who had all intentions on going to Texas Southern University. Uh, Doc was just explaining the process to us of how the Board of Regents has to approve the contract along with the financial numbers. That hit a deferment, <laughs> if you will, yesterday. Uh, Doc, what will happen next? Is, is there gonna be another meeting, another discussion? Is, is Fred McNair just in, in permanent limbo in, in terms of just the, the order of things? What, what has to happen next? In terms of the term they use deferred, I think that's one important context, which means there was no vote taken. Um, and so at some point there'll be a rescheduled meeting They'll reconvene and they'll re review whatever they uh, decided. And at that point, you may get a uh, decision that determines uh, whoever may be the next head coach at, uh, in, at this case, Texas Southern University. Uh, but that's the key. At this point, we are all waiting to see uh, what is next. Fred McNair. Uh, has and this to... is this is in the case I think is important when we talk about the context of when we're reporting. Uh, for those that are out here doing in the media. You'll hear people use terms um, alleged or they, it's been reported. And those are the contexts that I've always told everybody. And you know this, being in the business for a long time and a professional as yourself, um, you know, you report based on what you know. Uh, but I think a lot of people oftentimes, particularly now that we've gotten into this social media uh, phenomenon that, you know, people will push out their conjecture uh, based on what they had in terms of sources at times. Sometimes it's just their gut, their thoughts, talking to the personal people involved in the process at times, and they'll make a statement. And they'll also often make it declarative. And nothing is declarative, as you see, in the business of sports, uh, no matter what takes place. Uh, Fred McNair had to wake up this morning thinking, this wasn't how I was hoping things would go. Um, it, it has to be a, an, an uncomfortable position uh, when you when you play your hand, if you will, and and things look to be lined up, a mere formality, and and then you get this deferred decision, a lack of a decision, how, however we want to look at it and categorize that. Uh, Doc, this has to be the definition of limbo, if there ever was limbo. Oh, for sure. I mean, you're out there on the limb. Uh, but I think when you have professionals at that level, they understand the game long ago. Uh, and you make decisions understanding um, things may or may not work out. Uh, um, and you uh, put in positions where folks on the Alcorn State Braves, they wanted a decision. They wanted to move forward. Um, for whatever reason, he was not, not comfortable about committing to them. And whether it was a contract, I think if we level set, uh, people may not realize that his contract was up December 31st. So there was no guarantee that he had a job at even Alcorn State University for that matter, right? Uh, then there were talks about contract extensions. Uh, and then there may be points where you don't agree to terms in terms of the contract. So there are a lot of things that need to be considered, even in terms of his uh, employment at his at what was Alcorn State University in terms of what that looks like. So we don't know the particulars in regards to how those things went down in, in terms of uh, the negotiations, at least of what we were hearing uh, from that perspective. So where they broke down, you don't know what that was about. Was it a timing issue? Was it a price point issue? Was it a years on the contract issue? 
uh, did he even have the opportunity to return uh, to the Braves? And what did that look like? So those are all the things that I would say that people need to consider uh, when they start thinking about what is taking place now. Yeah, and, and Fred McNair is not, not the type of guy that's – it's going to be on social media letting you know all of his his business. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> he, he is old school uh, with a capital O. Uh, doc, doc, this reminds me of, of when I was probably about 25 years old. I, I had one girlfriend, then I had my eye on another girlfriend, and I made the move, and the new girlfriend, at the end of the day, I didn't have any girlfriends, Doc. <laughs> I, was, I was just out there. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I don't see a scenario where Fred McNair will be a single man in, in terms of coaching uh, when the 2023, 2024 season gets underway. Uh, do, you, do you see a scenario where he's not in the SWAC next year? You, I'm just asking your, your, your gut feeling here. I, I doubt it. I think some opportunity, even if it's as an assistant coach, but he may want to take a year off and see what the landscape looks like. These jobs are natural in terms of earning. Um, and so he may want to see uh, what other opportunities. He may go into media for all of that factor. We've seen that in terms of uh, coaches do that for a year until a particular job comes up. And who knows who's to say that at some point that he may not ultimately end up being a coach at Texas Southern University. So all things still on the table. Uh, but we did have someone who took advantage of the situation. Uh, Ed Reed has entered the chat. Uh, <laughs> Doc, well, just when we thought Bethune-Cookman, which is uh, that whole situation was, you know, about a year ago. Uh, and we thought maybe that that, that had been laid to rest. Uh, Ed Reed, who will go on social media. <laughs> he will go on social media and tell you what's on his mind. Uh, said something to the effect of, hey, Texas Southern, we, we need to talk football. Um, is there an opportunity for other people? Would this be good timing for someone who's, who's looking for a job to, to say, hey, eh, y'all deferring decisions now. Let, let, let's talk about what I have to bring to the table. That's, that's a really good decision. Uh, 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 I mean, a really good question in terms of what that looks like. Usually there's a process. So I haven't had any indication that people like can embed themselves within whatever a university process is to hire their next employee. Um, and so with that being said, I think that is more of a social media phenomenon. I think it drives likes and it's certainly entertainment, but I'm not sure how any institution seriously considers somebody seeking job opportunities by posting their desire on a social media platform. Well, Doc, you, you just you just poured cold water on Ed Reed, Doc. What did you do? He just poured <laughs> cold water. Ed, Ed's shooting this shot. Hey, Doc I'm just saying, like, didn't you hey, hey. talk about the grammar state job? <laughs> and I, my understanding, they'll move forward. They'll make a official announcement. Maybe we'll be surprised. And somehow he heads up at Grammar State University, uh, for that matter. But it seems like he's angling himself for a position. So maybe that one didn't work out. So I'll be surprised if it works out with Texas Southern University as well. Well, it's fun to talk about for sure. Uh, Doc, here's one thing that a lot of people don't talk about. It, it's not as sexy of a story. It doesn't make as big of a splash in the headlines. But we have a lot of schools out there with interim presidents, interim ADs. We might not know who the next leader is going to be, not only for the athletic department, but, but, but for the school itself. Uh, Doc, you've been around the administration of, of college athletics watching it for a while. Um, you know, it's your area of expertise uh, in terms of an of a academic mind. The impact when you have interim president or you don't know who the next person is going to be or at some of these schools, the political, you know, what happens politically outside of the universe, I mean, outside of the university could influence who the next person or people are going to be in these positions. Uh, tell us about the scope of, of that as an influential factor uh, in athletics and these decisions, because we've seen a lot of decisions or lack thereof made in the SWAC West in the last 30 days. Oh, it's, it's a significant impact when you talk about the status of an athletic director, a VP of athletics, a chancellor, a president, um, it is extremely important in whether they have an interim acting tag because sometimes their ability of their scope of work 
is determine whether they are full time or whether they have it as an interim acting position. And so that can get um, significantly involved or whether how much the board itself allows them to participate in that process, if you would. Ed Reed's calling. So, he heard what you said, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So with that said, the other part of your question uh, was regarding the politics. Uh, I would say in a lot of ways, the politics ha happen to be even more significant in regards to the landscape. You know, politics um, is all, all over uh, the country, as we know, particularly at this time. And oftentimes, we don't like to see it involved in sports. But the truth is, it is certainly embedded in sports. It is part of the country. So uh, those political decisions go a long way in, in terms of relationships and who people trust uh, in, in these positions of leadership. And so they can be uh, strong in terms of what that looks like, certainly impactful in terms of the components of who is in a particular leadership decision. And then once they get in the leadership position, it, also, it oftentimes will determine who they believe bring in to support them in terms of moving the institution forward. So fascinating discussions when you talk about coaching hires, AD hires, president hires, of what this looks for an institution. The other component of that is where these individuals are on a contract. You have a longstanding president that's been in a position that has a lot of respect for the institution. His ability to make a decision and for example, going back, maybe hiring somebody like Ed Reed, oftentimes you will see somebody that has a great deal more season be able to take a greater level of risk on a certain hire versus somebody that has a shorter period of time on their contract left when they're maybe renegotiating for a new contract or the contract is about to end, or again, if they have an interim or acting tag, their ability to take risk, and I'm talking about calculated risk, um, nothing that would get the institution in trouble. But as you know, there are various levels of risk. You know, are you hiring a coach that has head coaching experience? Are you hiring an AD with experience or one that's been in high leadership positions and this is going to be their first time leading a program? You know, we've seen that in various hires. And so all those things come into play at the decision level in regards to the employment of the individual with the institution, particularly I, in higher education. I asked this question of Charles Bishop. Uh, people are throwing around Andre Johnson's uh, name in the chat down there. He's, of course, a big name there in Houston uh, for what he was able to do on the football field. Uh, we talked about things going in cycles. And, you know, three, four years ago, there was a, a big push for bring us a name. We don't care if he has head coaching experience. We want names. And, and we saw that worked out in some places. Some places, you know, maybe not so much. Uh, it seems like this hiring cycle, it's bringing somebody we know, bring in somebody who's coached before. Keep it keep it in-house. Uh, would you agree that, that we've seen a, a cycle change in, in the hiring practices of the openings we've had uh, in college football, and in particular in HBCU football, particularly here in the SWAC? And it's a copycat league, um, and we see this across sports. Every three or four years, you see a cycle. Uh, at one time, historically in the SWAC, you saw where they were go to, going to get defensive coordinators and offensive coordinators um, that had been part of winning programs. That cycled off, and then all of a sudden, you've seen this cycle where uh, programs were getting D2 coaches, HBCU coaches, that had success, head coaching experience, and won championships or played for championships uh, at the Division II level, and then they were brought in to the conference at the next level. And they went through their cycle, and they had various levels of success. Then you started seeing a cycle in a lot of ways where uh, people were looking at Power Five institutions, uh, individual head coaches that were involved, position coaches, and they brought them over. Didn't necessarily have head coaching experience, but they had done it at a higher level. That was a cycle. Then you've seen the cycle, as you just spoke about, where you were getting in professionals. Deion Sanders effect, if you would. People brought in these coaches that had NFL experience, uh, were a name brand in themselves. And so you've seen this cycle. And it seems like the last cycle uh, is now to get back to a more traditional approach where you're looking at coaches that had head coaching experience, 
or longstanding assistant coaches get their chance. So it'll be interesting to see how long this cycle will take place and will people buck the trend and either continue uh, with that cycle or bucket and go in a different direction, maybe even revert back where they tend to go with a professional uh, individual that has some name, name nomenclature and brand association with them. Give me that word one more time, Doc. You know, whenever you, whenever it's seven letters or more, I, I got to write it down. Name and what? What you say, yeah. Doc? <laughs> Brand association and nomenclature. And nomenclature. to the framing of head coach. Yeah. All right. Next week, Miles, My, show, show him the wide shot here. We, we do, we do not have a a dictionary on set. Next time I get Doc up here, we we gotta we gotta get a dictionary, man. You 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 are bringing it, Doc. All right, back to business here. Uh, <laughs> let, let us know in the chat which cycle. Uh, a lot of conversation going over there. Which cycle did you like? Did you did you like the names? Did you like winning the, the press conference with the splash? Do you like the tried and true uh, uh, name and face and, and work ethic that, that is something you're familiar with, something that, that you can set your clock to, you know exactly what type of guy that you have? Or you want your school to zig while everyone else is zagging? Uh, just let us know there. Uh, we have Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of the SWAC. He's our special guest here on HBCU Game Day. We're just chatting here on a Wednesday afternoon. I'm Tali Carr in Atlanta. Hope everyone's week is going well. We've talked about the Texas Southern situation uh, deferred at the moment. Uh, got Fred McNair in limbo there. Doc, if you will, sir, let's talk about some of the things uh, here at HBCU Game Day, social media that people have been chatting about that got them all fired up. Uh, let's go back to Saturday, the Celebration Bowl. I had an opportunity to talk with Charlie Baker. He is the president of the NCAA. Uh, he's just been on the job for about a year. Uh, took over for Mark Emmert. He was the governor. He was a Republican governor of Massachusetts. Uh, and he has that type of, of, of thinking when it comes to administration and ideas. Uh, he's also been a CEO before. So when you talk about governance, some people look at the NCAA as like a, like a runaway train, like, hold on, everything is changing. Uh, the power structure continues to flip. Now the student athletes are getting paid. Uh, but I did ask him the question, what were some ideas that he had to uh, offer for HBCUs. He, he had a three-step plan that he just pulled right out of his pocket. So, so Miles, I'm giving you time to get that queued up there. Let's hear from Charlie Baker, the NCAA president, this past Saturday at the Celebration Bowl. The question being, what can the NCAA do to help HBCUs? We can do uh, for the HBCUs is three things. Number one, we help to help. We we need to help them stoke their fan base. This is one of the biggest things I think we need to do for all of our colleges, which is to do more because of our scale to create fan bases and grow the fan bases. Because at the end of the day, the fan base is what creates excitement and what creates brand, and that's what everybody's looking for here. The second is I think we can help them with the cost of what they pay for stuff. Um, you know, we've never really tried to create a purchasing collaborative as, a, as an organization, and yet we have 1,100 members. They buy a ton of the same stuff. We could save everybody 10, 15, 20 percent of what they pay for all the product that they buy to support their programs. It's real money that they could turn around and reinvest in other things. And I think the third thing we can do is be flexible about how we think about the way these organizations need to operate, what divisions they want to be in, what sports they want to be part of, and uh, and to recognize that, you know, kind of the standard way of doing stuff historically just isn't going to work going forward. Okay, that's his, uh, Charlie Baker there, the NCAA president. Doc, I hope that that audio came through uh, clear for you there, but uh, the things he talked about, he wanted to help stoke the fan base of HBCUs. He talked about a purchasing collective. Hey, everybody's buying Gatorade, right? Why don't we go in on the Gatorade and people can can save their money instead of buying it individually. Maybe, you know, get the Costco or Sam's, you know, discount, just making it very simple there. Uh, and he also talked about, hey, we can't continue to do things the same old way uh, in terms of, you know, classification and status. Why don't you just let people do what they want to do? Make it easier. Make it comfortable um, for them. Uh, on Instagram, this video really caught fire over right around 1,300 people 
uh, interacted with it, had 174 comments. Uh, Doc, I know you had a chance to listen to it. Uh, what did you think about what the NCAA president, Charlie Baker, had to say about uh, how you can help HBCUs? Well, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear about all that is deregulation. Uh, it's, <laughs> it sounds like when you think about it from a governance standpoint that they're, they, um, and under his leadership, that he is looking to deregulate uh, the way the NCAA currently works with all the rules and guidelines. One of the running jokes for years with the NCA is just how thick the rule book uh, was in terms of how people had to follow it and it was unrealistic of all these different rules. Uh, people said it was bigger than uh, some of these big city uh, phone books. If anybody can go back as I kind of date myself in terms of what that looks like, but that was how thick uh, these books were. Now they're PDFs, but they're still four or 500 pages, it seems like he's finding ways to deregulate that. Specifically, the first thing he talked about was uh, the next step in iteration from a brand awareness we talked about earlier with coaches associated with institution is brand recognition. So he talked about, you know, building out the fan base uh, in terms of expanding what that looks like. And so for me, that brings in brand recognition. Once you understand the HBCU fan as a brand, whether that is particularly with the conference or overall holistically, if you can find a way to expand that, uh, highlight that recognition, you can activate it even more in the marketplace, which usually drives revenue opportunities for the conferences. And as we know, that's the bottom line in sports is what type of revenue associations you can get to help folks uh, build their programs, which gets to his second idea, which moves into economies of scale uh, from a very business economic perspective. If you can find a way to take a uh, opportunity, as you talked about the Costco model, right, where now you buy in bulk, which reduces your price uh, price point that you can buy at which means everybody within that group was going to save money. So there was a time where you heard when these Costco's and Sam's were going up, you used to have these collectives of families or people on the same street, you know, they would go in and buy all these groceries and then somehow they would find a way to split it, which reduced their cost in terms of what they would do if they went to a local grocery store. So that's the same concept where he's talking about a way to reduce expenses which again, if you can reduce expenses, means the revenue that you're coming in, you have a better chance of your profit loss statement at the end of the day. And so the third thing is the flexibility of division play, which is extremely intriguing to me when he brought that up, which again is a way to deregulate. At the division one level, to simplify this, there is a minimum amount of sports that you must play. He could be simply talking about that you may be able to reduce the number of sports that you need to be at the division one level. Um, so that's a particular example of where he may be saying that they're going to find the flexibility to allow institutions to operate at various levels. There is also a rule that if you at the division one level that you have to have certain sports, maybe that's the case where they're going to look at going away from that. The ability to move to FBS, which has been a great conversation of interest for many HBCU span, uh, fans, particularly with the SWAC in regards to their ability as the SWAC to move up to the FBS level. Well, right now there is no way a conference, there's no guidelines on the books where a conference can move up. Each institution has to move up individually, uh, moving from said FCS to the FBS level. Maybe there's some governing structures, some bylaws that allow that to take place. So. It's going to be interesting to see what are the particulars, but those are some examples of what I see, the three major points that he made uh, in the uh, dialogue that he had with you in your interview. Do you, do you think he can be effective if he gets the support, if if there's if there's buy-in, if the, if the commissioners say, hey, I, I like that idea, let's work together. Um, do, you, do you think a person that, that kind of comes from that governance uh, background, who, who's been a CEO, uh, and maybe, you know, looks at doing things a little differently. Uh, 
Do you, do you think that works in 2024 and beyond? Well, I think it's extremely important. In a leadership position, no matter where you are, whether that's at the dean's level, a president level, a coaching level, if we want to take it back to sports, or a politician, governor, a certainly executive CEO, one of the biggest traits that you have when you look at leadership is their ability uh, to bring people together. So his ability to navigate that space and uh, get people to be on the same page is going to be very important to see how his um, reign goes as long as he's the president of the NCAA. We see so much change in the NCAA. His ability to navigate that space is going to be extremely important to see his level of success. So I'm fascinated to see what this looks like. I've had my concern, like many fans with the NCAA, I am an advocate of the college athlete, uh, particularly having an opportunity. Uh, I would like to see even more done in that area. I don't think NIL alone is, is enough. That's really coming from outside. You have even talks now with uh, college players being played directly uh, by institutions. So you have so many different levels and mouths to feed at the NCA in terms of whether that is Division One, FBS, uh, FCS, and you even break that down to Power 5, G5 uh, in terms of that, and they call it the a, a different term, term uh, they use in terms of those uh, Power 5 in regards to them being able to have their own autonomy is what they like to call the autonomy five. But that's not even talking about Division two or Division three level. So it's fascinating to see how he's going to have to see how these different parts work in regards to making the NCAA uh, still matter in this current framework of the world that we operate today. You know, Doc, and and forgive me out there in the in the whole wide world of the internet. Someone made this point on one of our channels, uh, and I don't remember the name, but they said something to the effect of the most influential you know schools and organizations inside the NCAA aren't your biggest stakeholders. Meaning that you know the SEC, the Big Ten, they don't need the NCAA. They can go do their own thing. And that could very well happen because there's been, as you watch these big conferences, they're, they're just eating each up. The Pac-12 went away, Doc. Never in my life would I have thought the Pac-12 would have just disappeared. Like, <laughs> it was like a couple of weeks. Like, hey, we got a problem here, you know. Blah, blah, blah. And a couple of weeks later, it's gone. If these schools break off, if these Power Five schools just become their own thing, would that benefit HBCUs? in that the NCAA could then pay more attention, forget about, you know, this, they just become their whole other league in the SEC, Big Ten, ACC, whatever, that they could pay more attention to the schools that remain, including those at the FCS level and Division Two. I certainly could see that in a lot of ways how it could be helpful to, to, the, uh, to the HBCUs because now they become more important in terms of what they bring to the table. And you always are going to focus on your key stakeholders. Uh, the concern I have there is what about, about the revenue that would go with uh, those Power 5 institutions? In this case, it seems now uh, Power 2, a lot of people are using that term, terminology for the Big Ten and SEC. Heck, we still have conversations with whether the ACC is going to exist in a couple of years, because I agree with you. Well, what we thought was the Pac-12 uh, that looked at one time that it may be going to the Pac-16 and now all of a sudden it's a pack two and they're in a fight for their very existence uh, moving forward with only Washington State uh, and Oregon State left to try to hold it together. And you have literally the legal system coming in to say who has the power to continue to govern what are the next ste steps for what was the pack 12 and now the pack two. With all that said, it is fascinating because I think what is holding this together in a lot of ways, while we focus in a great deal with football, remember football in terms of what was the BCS in its iteration now of the CFP, the college football playoff, that's not a part of the NCAA in terms of who controls it. It may have the bylaw governing policy, but that is totally separate from the NCA. So the only thing now that was really holding the NCA together is the NCA basketball tournament and its billion dollar deal. So in a lot of ways, you saw Fox that was flirting around uh, with the ability to pull out uh, some teams from the NIT and start their own 
thing. You saw the fallout of that in IT, which is a separate governing body from the NCA, even though the NCA purchased, it governs by itself. And we had the talk most recently that the automatic bids that were part of the NIT, if you did not qualify the NCAA tournament, has gone away. You have a lot of HBCU fans that were concerned about that because that was one of the process. If they did not win the tournament and they won the regular season, they knew they would have an automatic bid to the NIT. So I conclude all this and talk about the fact that the basketball money is extremely important to see uh, is it realistic for what seems to be now the power two breaking away? I think in a lot of ways, what they are fighting for is to gain even more control and power of the autonomy side of what they can do uh, as members of the NCA. And you keep seeing, as long as they push for more autonomy, the ability to make their own decisions because of their size and the money that they control, that the NCA in a lot of ways continues to acquiesce. So I don't necessarily see that changing. So I think in the long scope of things, I don't think you see it realistically that these programs will break away totally from the NCA and do their own thing. And I know there's great talk out there, but I think realistically what they will fight for is just more and more control. Let's say specifically if we look at the dollar amount that they control 98% of the dollars out there. 97% of the governing policies are rules. Why do you leave? Essentially what you do is you push, they have 99.5% of the money, 99.5% of the control. And if you have that, you effectively run the NCAA anyway. There's no need, no reason to leave. That's how the mob does it. <laughs> they just come in. Exactly. <laughs> take over let you look like you're in control and they just run the organization uh doc one of the the first one of the first points he made he said he wanted to stoke uh the fan base i can't remember if he used the exact word stoke but something to the effect of stoke the fan bases i think that was the word he used some of our fans took that personal <laughs> they said we're <laughs> fine our fan base is fine other people are like no, it ain't. Have you been to a game that's not a homecoming, that's not a classic, that's not the celebration bowl? Uh, wherever you fall on that argument, look, I've seen big crowds. I've seen crowds where, you know, I'm asking, where's everybody at? Uh, it exists on all levels. Uh, Doc, but when you look at the crowd situation, uh, we've seen this. We saw it at Jackson State, how you can scale when you get people interested in your product that were previously not interested or unaware of your product altogether. Is there a scenario, is it a, is it a definite, are there other avenues if HBCUs want to continue to grow and grow their popularity and scale and grow their revenue, because that's all a part of it, that you somehow got to draw in some fans that you don't have right now? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we've seen this recently with the uh, growth of the fan interest over the last two years, Coach Prime. And I know some people do not like to invoke his name, but the data is there to prove it. And I've done many research uh, and actually coined the term when it came up, the prime effect in many ways, uh, in direct relationship to research I've read and done on the Flutie effect. So it is real in regards to the data showing that. I love the business framework of what I call continuous improvement. Um, and so I can give you a specific example when you look at Texas Southern University in a lot of ways, uh, from the board to the president, to um, provost, uh, to VPs, to deans, that most of them in their framework in some way of their iteration of, of how they want to continue to move the university. It's always about improvement. How do you get better than what you are? And so most people that are in some type of business intentional institutional framework always look at that. So that's where I am when I talk to fans. It's not to say that you're not great, but it's talking about how can you be better? How do you improve of where you are? How do you analyze what you do well and do it even better. Quickly, take in a marketing framework. Many people may 
heard of the SWOT analysis, where you look at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I believe from a marketing standpoint, particularly on game day attendance or even social media platforms of how do you grow your fan base? You look at your strengths, the culturally rich sporting HBCU diaspora and its history is there. So now you talk about, all right, you pinpoint that and you t how do I even make that stronger? How do I develop even more affinity to my fans? We look up in sports marketing, a thing called Sports Escalate. It tells you where your fans are on an imaginary escalator. The highest level, if you're at the top of the escalator, is where you want your fans to be. That's the type where you think about them always buying merchandise, paint, uh, your face are painted at games, if you would, or they're buying the courtside seats, they're in the suites. Those are heavily influenced fans. Those are the ones that give to the program regularly, do not miss an occasion to give in some way. Many of them are active in booster groups of talking about how can they invest in their programs more. And then you slide down to the escalator all the way off where folks are just getting on the offering. Those are folks that may not know about HBCUs or may just have a, a general idea that they may come just a homecoming or a big event. Your job as somebody that looks at continuous improvement uh, that is engaged in any format with HBCU sporting athletics or the sports culture is to get folks higher on that escalator, which is simply another way to say continuous improvement. How do you get that done to get more revenue opportunities involved with that? So when I hear him say stoke from a business perspective, that's what I see. We know that you are doing a lot of great things at HBCUs, but how do I, as the president of the NCA, help the commissioners and the ADs and the presidents and chancellors uh, even improve on what they do well? And I think in a lot of ways that is his responsibility because he does it for the other institutions because they demand it. Now it sounds like our presidents, our chancellors, our boards, and our commissioners are asking to have a seat at the table and make sure their voice is heard, just like we heard the, the commissioners go up to Capitol Hill and voice their framework on NIL and, and paying players. That's one of the ways that you get the difference that a lot of our fans are clamoring for is to make sure that there's more involvement to say that HBCUs are important, we are here to stay, and we, we want a voice and a stake at the table in terms of how we get better among of us understanding the cultural form, influence that we have. And a lot of times that is spoken in two languages um, in terms of what HBCU means to us, which is one perspective our fans speak to, but also in terms of the greater society, what HBCU means to others. We have to live in a world currently that sits between the two. I love that escalator analogy. I love that. The, the people at the bottom are the what y'all ought to do people. <laughs> exactly. Won't even get on this. What y'all ought to do is build some stairs. That's what, yeah. Uh, we, we, we know those fans. Uh, that is great. That was great. I love that. All right, Doc, let's, uh, let's fast forward here, brother. Me, me and you can sit here and talk until Christmas. Uh, I do appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate yours. I appreciate the time of the people joining us in the chat. Uh, before we had a chance to talk to uh, Charlie Baker, we talked to our very own Vaughn Wilson right here on this set. And, and you know Vaughn. Vaughn is a very passionate fellow. When he believes in something, uh, he says it with his chest, ten toes down, chest out. Vaughn is going to say what he has to say. Uh, I don't know how we got – I don't even remember how we got him fired up, Doc. But this was Vaughn's hot take of the week. Uh, they got a lot of traction on social media when he talked about who should and who shouldn't support athletics. For all of those presidents and chancellors out there at HBCUs that think you're bigger than the football coach, uh, be the president. But you need to support your football coach because they're they're some of your best recruiters. Yep. Speak on it. We need to pass the plate. <laughs> uh -oh. no, I, I knew it got I real when he got that hand up. <laughs> I don't like to see presidents go, oh, athletics over there. I really – y'all gave me the mic now. <laughs> I really think some schools should just drop athletics. Because year after year they're hiring a coach 
Coach comes in, they won't give them any resources, and they make it seem like it's the coach's fault. You can't win without resources. So if you don't, if you're not gonna win, don't play athletics. You got coaches' lives, student athletes' lives, twenty-five seconds, the support staffs' lives in your hands. If you're not gonna support athletics, just drop it. Don't play like you want athletics. I think some schools need to look at that. Some so. HBCUs need to look at it. Vaughn not playing with them today. Nah, just, just, <laughs> Vaughn said some HBCUs, period. Right. Woo, Vaughn, <laughs> woo, woo. Anything else you want to get off your chest? Hey, Vaughn came with it, boy. He was fired up on that. Yes, Vaughn, he did. Vaughn, Vaughn accused me of going silent. Doc, I'm known for, for letting people take off and then just falling back. <laughs> I, I disappear in the bushes like uh, Homer Simpson. I just lean back, lean back, lean back. Uh, but, but part of his point there was the synergy between the top executive at the university, the president, on down to athletics. We, we saw Dr. Charles McClellan, the commissioner of the SWAC, come on uh, with the last media call of the year for the SWAC football teleconferences, and he talked about it. Look, you can follow the success of an athletic program and how that – is dovetailing with your enrollment. You get better in athletics, your school becomes more popular. It's a win-win for everybody. It is the front door of the university in many cases. Uh, we've heard that time and time again. How important, Doc, is it to have that lock and step synergy from the top down with the support of athletics and the role that it plays in the growth of any institution across America? It is important. Uh, it is imperative uh, if you want um, your institution to continue to improve, to use a phrase that we use in the last uh, dialogue question we had. And so certainly the synergy of everybody being on the same page or at least agreeing on some principles of how they're going to move the institution uh, forward is important. I talked about the Dion effect, which was an offset of what came out of the Duke the Flutie effect, or simply put, the Flutie effect. What that is for folks that may or not have heard of it or forgot about it is Flutie was involved in a classic game in the Orangeburg where he threw a Hail Mary uh, that landed in the end zone and caught by the receiver for a touchdown, uh, um, I believe, at that time against Miami uh, in regards to what took place for. It was Boston, they won College. The game. Boston College versus Boston Miami. Boston College was the team he played and and who he played for what you came back and found out that the enrollment for boston college increased the applications for those increased the actual number of uh measured by gpa and sat scores actually increased in terms of the interest and so ultimately over a said period of time what you found out is what they coined the flutie effect and it's simply what that is is that uh, when you have these large effects of folks that can uh, win at a high level, it attracts people to the institution. And that's where you kind of got the coin that sports is the front porch of any institution. Because that's so visible out there. It gets the television advertisement. It, it plays the games. Uh, and so a lot of people are involved and follow it. No matter where they are on that escalator, they'll tend to watch a game. So the more excitement you can bring to that, the more interest you have in your institution. So there is data to support uh, that if you provide the resources, um, hire the right people and get things involved and ultimately win, it's going to pay dividends for your institution in terms of enrollment. And that is the biggest precursor to the success of a student. It's enrollment numbers. And oftentimes we forget that because the larger enrollment, the more you can spend in various areas, academically and athletically at an institution. So um, there's no short answer to say just how important it is to have synergy from the bottom to the top of any institution, but particular uh, in higher education in regards to seeing the success of an institution at its highest level. Uh, seems to always be the case when you have everybody on the same page. It doesn't mean that people can't have disagreements, but at some time you find a consensus. And with that consensus, you're able to move 
the institution forward. Well, this got people talking. Uh, Vaughn did. Uh, Miles, I'll tell you what, me and Dr. Gaville will continue to talk about this. R roll that B-roll while we talk, Miles, of the uh, Miles, our director. What's up, Miles? He's always on it. Uh, we, we took some screenshots of some of the uh, comments that people had. They were fired up about Charlie Baker. They were fired up about Vaughn Wilson. Uh, we've just given people a lot. They've given us lots of content since the Celebration Bowl. Um, and people really had a lot to say. Some people were, you know, really, really down with uh, with Vaughn, and, and some people, you know, saw it quite differently. Um, you know, we got counterpoints to it. Uh, there should be room for amateurism in college athletics, even though it's already becoming a uh, big business. You know, you, you just look at that point. You know, Doc, I see some schools that are are, are good in in some things, and man. The football team, you know, looks like it might might be better as a Division Two team, <laughs> even though they're Division One. I. I don't want to call no names, but we all know those teams. There's one or two out there that you know they're going to get one or two wins uh, every year. You, you talked about deregulation a little earlier. Um, I don't know, Doc. You think some people should be moving up, moving down, moving around, letting it go all together in, in areas where they just can't seem to get it together? I would say this, that there's always a continuation where you should be evaluating where your institution fits uh, and what is the best purpose of your institution in terms of those long-term strategies uh, that you are appointed as the leader of your institution of where you want to go, uh, which in some cases may mean that you need to move uh, down a level, particularly if you're operating at FCS, you may need to go to D2 and find what is a better fit. But the same precursor may say that you need to stay the course and maybe just invest more in your program. And in other occasions, as we alluded to, and there may be a point where you look at moving up. You may be look at moving from the FCS to the FBS level. So you should continuously always look at your institution over a period of time to say, all right, what are our goals and aspirations? And what is our strategic plan to get there? Whether that means um, operating at one classification or another. You know, my gut says, look, once you stop, you can't get it back. Like, you can't be starting and stopping programs. You, you can't have a hibernation. Uh, but we saw UAB, uh, the, the Blazers, they, so, someone decided we're no longer playing football. Uh, that only lasted for a year, but Doc, they came back strong. Yeah, they kind of level set, and that went kind of back as what I've studied about that, the political um, nature of, of what was going on in Alabama, which was a precursor of them getting out of the football business. Uh, new leadership came in. Uh, they were able to coalesce where they were uh, from that leadership and the politics. And as they evaluated and saw the plan of what they wanted for UAB, they moved back and decided to bring football back. And they've been pretty good, at least for a short period, when they first brought it back. But that's a ex uh, great example of you look, looking at what is best for the institution. And we have to be careful that that can change. As leadership changes, they're the direction of what they were brought in to do by a board, for example, may dictate uh, what they believe is best for the institution based on what their uh, governance is giving them in terms of what they see as the vision for an institution. So there are a lot of moving parts uh, when you look at the critical, op critical operations of higher education, particularly from a leadership perspective. So fascinating when you get into these types of dialogues of where we see our institutions going and why I love being in a place where I get to study the next evolution and provide some say in making recommendations and suggestions of these or some considerations of what you may think about as you move forward. Yep, we got some love for Allen University, Florida Memorial down in the uh, comments there by Karen Griffin. They new programs or restarted programs and uh, took, them, took them a couple years, but, but definitely two entertaining teams. Got some big wins uh, this past season. So we have seen that Lazarus effect on, on the football field. Um, as well. Doc, it's been a fast... Two great examples yeah. when you talk about those. Uh, Florida Memorial, uh, that last weekend, they were in a conference championship fight at the NIA level uh, to get it done. 
Didn't work out, but they were right there. You look at Allen coming down to the last weekend as they played Benedict. There was a, a scenario if they won that game that they would have been playing for the SIAC championship in a rematch against Benedict. So uh, in short order, those programs have built. Uh, one of them has lost their coach. So it'll be interesting to see can they continue with the trajectory they have under the uh, president and AD's leadership. All right, Doctor, your your predictions uh, for the SWAC West when we get closer to summer. Do you think this is a scenario? I, I tossed it out to Charles Bishop with with so much and and still moving parts going on in that division. Do you think we have to blow up all expectations of what we think might happen based on what we saw last year? Uh, because everything over there, at least from the top, is, is going to be brand new. Oh, it's a lot of moving parts, and so there's. Without question that I think um, the West will be up for grabs. Uh, I think they were just reported that Harold Blood that was at Southern University is transferred to Mississippi Valley. So, um, and with the senior graduates at the quarterback position, uh, you have a couple of the transfers at the quarterback positions in the transfer portal. Um, so those are questions of whether those guys are gonna come back, are they gonna leave? Um, and so that key position in leadership it's certainly going to make things up for grabs. And then what are these teams going to do on the defensive side of the ball under the new head coaching leadership uh, at at least four of these institutions? So uh, it's fascinating to see what's going to take place. And then we had an interview with uh, the commissioner of the SWAT, Dr. Charles McCullen. And this spring, he put out there that there it will be some dialogue on whether will they continue with the divisional format uh, where the champion of the divisions will play each other, or will they go to what you've seen at the um, Power 5 level, Power 2 level, where the top two teams, regardless of divisions, will play in a championship format. So that decision is, is still here to be made. There'll be a lot of dialogue, and then they're going to be, uh, obviously, the presidents and chancellors will ultimately make a decision because there'll be some cost constraints. Uh, do you do it in such a way that you uh, blow up the divisional alignment that has taken in travel considerations or do somehow you still do it with the travel considerations but still take the top two teams? So not only will we may be looking at the West, we may be looking at a total different format for the Southwest Athletic Conference in football. So just wait and see. We still have more news to follow in regards to what is going to be the outcome of the spring meetings if that decision is made well that let, let's let's put that into effects for a thought experiment and then let's rewind it that would have given us the yeah. last two years that would have given us jackson state and famu in the orange blossom classic and then would have run it back in the swag championship game because they would have been the top two teams because uh, jackson state would have gone unbeaten famu had only lost two uh, Jackson State, if, if if memory serves me correct, I don't think anybody was unbeaten in the West. But but you see where I'm going. Uh, yes, that that would be interesting because it was very anticlimactic for FAMU those those last two years, knowing we're right there with the top team. But since we decided pretty much the division in week one, it, it not not that it was all for naught, but it, it took a, it took away a lot of potential for what could have been. Uh, a hyped up rematch. Yeah, you remind rewind it three years ago. Uh, that means you would have fam you traveling to Jackson State for a rematch versus Prairie View. That also eradicates their bid that would likely would have come in terms of NCA. So you're taking that off the table. So that's something to consider uh, whether you um, like that idea or not. You need, you need to understand it. Last year, um, you still would have had the same scenario. You had had a rematch with FAMU going back to Jackson instead of Southern being there. That would have been an interesting uh, matchup, maybe not as uh, as it was year one. But the thing is, you take it back to this third year, uh, regardless of the divisions, guess who would have played in the championship game this year? It still would have been Prairie View and FAMU uh, because Prairie View and Alcorn State uh, were tied with the second best record in the conference at six and two, because people may have forgot to realize that Jackson State and Alabama State were 
uh, finished at five and three. So they were outside of that. Alabama State beat Jackson State, so they would have had the tiebreaker there. But if you go back to the tiebreaker between the Braves and the Panthers, Prairie View still wins that tiebreaker. So regardless of divisions in this third iteration of this expanded 12-team SWAC, it still would have been Prairie View and FAMU. So it's intriguing because in some cases, it could have created a lot of interest. In, in this last case, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, I, I, I like the drama that we had. The, the SWAC West drama was good, but I would have loved to have seen a, a FAMU-Jackson State rematch uh, during those uh, Coach Prime and, and Willie Simmons head-to-head uh, exactly. matchup. So, so I, oh, that's going to be a tough decision. Uh, there, there's, there, there's good points to be made on, on both sides. Uh, Doc, do you think we'll have more, more big, big news before the new year? We, we still got today's oh, the yes. 20. This, we, got this, 10, this we got 10, 11 HBCUs. days to go. Yeah, this is HBCUs. There's no doubt in my mind that we will have big news one way or the other. And I would suggest we'll probably have several items to discuss uh, that are significant news before the year ends. It's just what we do in HBCU sports. It certainly seems what we do in the SWAC. So without a doubt in my mind, uh, just keep uh, tuned in to HBCU game today because the news is coming. All right, and you do more than just come and, and contribute with us from time to time. You have your own show online. Uh, tell the people how they can check you guys out online and, and when, when your show is, you know, what days, where they can find you. I appreciate that opportunity. You can find me on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's Dr. Ville's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, and that's Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we do an hour live show that really looks at the business side of this. So if you enjoy some of the dialogue that Tali and I have, and we can give you more with Charles uh, Bishop and White Washington uh, right there at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. You can follow us on Facebook Live, YouTube, uh, and then all, all your social media platforms. You can get our information. During the fall, which just ended, we also do a segment on Sunday that really gets us deep thought into the football season. But unfortunately, that has come to an end, so that segment comes to an end until 2024 in the fall season as we bring it back. Uh, as Tali alluded to, there will be a lot of things for us to discuss on the Sunday edition of the show. But we do have some good stuff for basketball, uh, men's and women's, as well as softball and track and field. And we'll keep you up to date, particularly the business perspective of all this, on Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Doc, they, they packed it in the Akadome last night to, to see Bronny James. Now, those same people, need they need to come back the next game when Bronny's not there. We they You saw there, there was a seat for you. So, right, and, and that's a part of where we have to get better in terms of the marketing of our sport. That was a brand, and that was an event in itself. So if you want to continue to see those butts in the seats, we got to find ways to create the brand recognition of making more incentives for those folks to be back in those seats. Uh, and I'm sure they've seen an electrifying game in many different ways. So the power is on both sides. If they come back, you bring the power that is necessary to create the environment where you get um, the players that are playing now and even better players to come. You also get the money associated with packing out the stadium. And then with that, it allows them to do more marketing and events associated to making sure that you get a return on your investment with even more fans coming. So it's circular in nature, uh, and you're absolutely right. That is the effect that needs to be caused in regards to us taking HBCUs to next level on a regular, continuous basis. All right, I like it, Doc. The power lies on both sides. The fans have to do their part, but the schools have to have to do their part as well. Can't just build it and they will come. you you, you got to market it market it as well all right he is dr that means supporting your local media such as hbc <laughs> game day inside the hbcu news in regards to helping us get the information out yeah. i'll say that plain and simple i know you don't necessarily want to jump out there because you are the business leader in this but i can say it from a sports business perspective that's the synergy that must take place to get this going hey baby the product looks better the more support there is more lights, more cameras, better lenses. Get the audio more right. Action. Get the graphics right. We, we get it all right. It, it all takes money. Uh, as John Grant said, can't pay for anything with exposure. Got to have that dollar, baby. 
<laughs> yes, sir. All right, he's Dr. Kenyatta Cavill joining us today from H Town down in Houston, baby. It's it's D first city, but they they gonna they gonna get it together. They gonna they gonna they gonna make a decision about something. Somebody's gonna be the football coach there in twenty twenty four. They will get it done, and when they do, we'll be we'll have Doc right back here to discuss it and break it down. Uh, if I don't talk to you again, have a great holiday to you and your family, man. Uh, always appreciate your time, Doctor Kenyatta Cavill. Same to you. I appreciate it. Happy holidays to you and your family. All right, to everyone else out there, we'll talk to you a little later. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here at HBCU Game Day. We'll see you a little later. Stream's over.